Hi everyone, welcome back to day two of antivirals. I hope you all are doing well. I hope you're having a good day. Um, I've had pretty crappy days, I'm not gonna lie. The last few days have been really rough. And you know, the sprinkles on top of the icing today are that this is like the 10th time I've tried to record this video anything and everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. So if I seem a little short or grumpy, I apologize. It is because I am extremely frustrated. But here we are. We're going to get through it somehow. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick up where we left off. So at the end of day one, we started talking about part three, which is all about examples of antiviral drugs. So we mostly focused on resistance and kind of from the broader perspective of how does resistance occur. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about mechanisms of action for different antiviral drugs, and then we'll finish off the topic talking about the current coronavirus pandemic and talking about some of the drugs that are being used in patients for that. So we are going to start with one of my favorite pictures from our textbook. And looking at this picture, if we first focus on the yellow part, so in the middle there, we can see that those are the four bases that are attached to sugars. And then surrounding that yellow square and surrounding those bases that are attached to sugars, we have her see different types of drugs. And all of these antiviral drugs are analogs of the bases. And so it turns out that many of our antivirals that are in in our arsenal against viruses are nucleotide and nucleoside analogs. And many of them actually work via chain termination. So we're going to take a look at one a little bit closer and we're going to look at this one right here. So let's go ahead and start with acyclovir. So the structure of acyclovir is shown on the right and then we see a guanosine, guanosine, tomato, tomato. And so from this, you can hopefully see that acyclovir is a guanosine analog. And the way that a cyclovir works is it works via chain termination. So essentially what happens is it's going to stop replication. And we can figure that out by looking at the structure. So if we take a look at the guanosine that we have on the left, here is our deoxyribose. We can tell it's deoxyribose by numbering our carbons. So carbon two here does not have an OH, which makes it deoxyribose. And here we have that oh so famous three prime OH. And we always talk about in 185 and genetics and all of your classes that you've taken here, how important that free three prime OH is, particularly during replication and synthesis of nucleic acids. Well, if we take a look here at a cyclovir, it looks like someone took that deoxyribose and they just kind of chopped it off and chopped the bottom off. And so a cyclovir has no free three prime OH. And so we're not going to have elongation of the chain because of that. Well, it turns out for a cyclovir, a cyclovir is something called a pro drug. And pro drug means that it is a precursor of an antiviral drug. So what this means is when this drug first enters a cell, whether it is administered orally or topically, it is not active. It actually has to be activated within the cell before it does its job as a chain terminator. And we tend to use acyclovir against herpes simplex viruses. So it can be used against cold sores, genital herpes. We can also use acyclovir against shingles as well. So many different herpes viruses we use acyclovir for. So let's go ahead and on a blank page here, let's kind of draw how this prodrug works and kind of what happens. So I'm not going to draw the entire acyclovir structure. Structure. What I'm going to do is for the base, I'm going to represent the base here as a circle, and I'm just going to draw the bottom half that would be 
the sugar, but instead is kind of the top half of that deoxyribose. So here is our prodrug that we have, and this prodrug is going to get into the cell, but it is only activated if a cell is infected by herpes virus. So once this gets into the cell, if there is not a herpes virus present, nothing will happen. Um, but if there is a herpes virus present, then something called TK, which is short for thymidine kinase, so an enzyme ends an ACE, and specifically it's a kinase, so we can guess that this is going to add a phosphate group. So this thymidine kinase is going to add a phosphate group to that prodrug. So after the addition of the phosphate group, we get something that looks like this. And the part that makes this specific to if a cell is infected by a herpes virus is that this thymidine kinase is a viral enzyme. So this viral enzyme is what's adding on that first phosphate group. Now, again, if you think back to when you first learned about DNA replication, we talk about how we need DNTPs for replication. And DNTPs have three phosphate groups. And this one right now, if this is supposed to be a DNTP, only has one. So once the thymidine kinase adds on a phosphate group, we can then use a cellular kinase. And that's going to add on the second and the third phosphate group. So what we then end up with is our final fully functional acyclovir that resembles a DNTP, but of hers, I'm going to point you to the bottom here where it is missing that free three prime OH. So if we think about replication, so let's go ahead and draw some DNA here and we're in the middle of replicating, so let's go ahead and add our viral DNA polymerase here. So as we replicate DNA, we read from three to five and we synthesize from five to three prime. So one of the things that is going to happen is the viral DNA polymerase is going to incorporate the drug and when that acyclovir is incorporated into this chain that is elongating, because we have no free three prime OH, we are going to stop replication. And so eventually the cell will likely undergo apoptosis and again, one of the cool things about this drug is the way that it is made specific is that it is activated at first by that thymidine kinase. So if you recall from day one, we talked about how DNA viruses tend to mutate slower, they don't evolve as fast, and um, even though that is the case, we can still get resistance to antivirals. So when it comes to herpes simplex viruses, they do get resistance to acyclovir and of HERS, resistance is going to arise spontaneously. And this is going to happen during replication. So even though DNA polymerases certainly have a higher fidelity than RNA polymerases, they still are not perfect and you can still get mutations and of course these are random mutations and sometimes those random mutations can provide benefits to the virus and of course those are the ones that will take over the pool as a whole. And so in terms of where we might predict that mutations arise, you can probably hypothesize that it's going to be in the enzymes that are most directly dealing with the drug. And so we often see enzyme, we often see um, thymidine kinases that have mutations and these mutations lead to thymidine kinases that can't phosphorylate acyclovir. 
And so what you end up with is you always have a prodrug, and if you always have a prodrug, then it's kind of useless. It's an inactive form of the drug. We also see mutations in the viral polymerase, and that viral polymerase can't incorporate the fully activated acyclovir, so the one that has those three phosphate groups on it. So those are the two main types of mutants that we see in terms of ones that take over populations of viruses. Again, you can imagine that from the virus perspective, this is going to be very beneficial to them. So kind of moving forward, let's circle back to topic or to day one, I should say, and circle back to amantadine. So when we first started talking about antivirals, we talked about how we did a lot of blind screening, and blind screening is a lot of effort, doesn't really work a lot, or doesn't work very well, but we did have success with one drug, and that was amantadine. So here is the structure, again, of amantadine. And when it comes to influenza, we have three main groups of antiviral drugs. So we have drugs that work on um, neuraminidase or as neuraminidase inhibitors. We have a drug that works on the endonuclease that is responsible for cap snatching. And then we have the amatines, which amantadine is a part of, and they work on influenza entry. So let's remind ourselves of what influenza entry looks like. So influenza, of course, has a segmented genome. It has an envelope and it gets endocytosed. And when it gets endocytosed, it ends up in an endosome. And one of the things that we talked about that happens is protons are pumped into that endosome to decrease the pH, which allows the fusion peptide to flip out and allows for the fusion of the endosomal membrane and the membrane of the virus to occur, which allows the genome to then come out. And then first, eventually, influenza makes its way to the nucleus so that it can do some cap snatching and steal our mRNA caps to use as a primer. So if we take a look at that endosome that we've drawn there, what we are going to do is we're going to specifically zoom in on the viral membrane. So we're going to draw a lipid bilayer here. And one of the things that I have not yet told you is that when we have those protons that are being pumped in, they also have to make their way into the virion itself. So what we're looking at here and what we've drawn so far is a viral membrane, and this is inside the virus, and then this is the endosome. And this bright blue protein that we just drew, this is known as the M2 protein ion channel. And the entire purpose or goal of the ion channel is to allow protons to go to the inner membrane. So protons are going to flow through to go to the inside of the virus. Again, so we have that decrease in pH. Well, the way that amantadine works is amantadine gets stuck inside of this proton channel, and amantadine is going to block the protons from flowing in. And if we block those protons from flowing in, we block the next step, and so we don't get membrane fusion that occurs. So amantadine is still used. It is FDA approved, um, but we don't use it a lot. We don't use it as often as some of the other antivirals that we have against flu. And part of the reason is 
the resistance that occurs. And so in terms of where we find resistance, this channel here, there is a bunch of amino acids that line the inner part of the channel. And amantadine actually interacts with them. And so what we see is that there are amino acid changes in the inner channel that make it so amantadine no longer sticks there. And so those protons can flow right on in. Um, another reason why we see a lot of resistance to amantadine is actually because of pig farmers. So just like pigs also get a lot of antibiotics, they also get antivirals. And one of the things that farmers have noticed is that when pigs um, are given amantadine, they actually grow bigger. And so they continue to feed these pigs these antivirals. And so unfortunately, that has led to a lot of resistance to this drug as well. So this is one mechanism of action for influenza antivirals. Let's talk about neuraminidase inhibitors. And we're not actually going to talk about the cap snatching inhibitor, but if you recall back to how cap snatching works, there is an endonuclease that chops off the mRNA cap from our mRNAs, and that endonuclease comes with influenza. And so we have an antiviral that actually works by blocking that endonuclease. But what we're going to do is we are going to focus on the neuraminidase inhibitors. So let's recall how influenza actually exits the cell. So here is our cell plasma membrane. This is inside the cell. So if you remember from assembly and exit, influenza does concerted assembly. So everything kind of comes together at the plasma membrane. And then we have budding that occurs. And after that budding, we then have our virion. And we also, let's see if I can fit this in here somewhere. This little receptor here is sialic acid. So one of the things that has to happen after influenza buds from the plasma membrane is we have to have the step of maturation. And so the whole job of neuraminidase is to, of course, cleave that sialic acid so that the progeny virions can be released. So we have two antivirals here that we are going to talk about. There are other examples of neuraminidase inhibitors, but we're going to talk about kind of the more common ones that you hear of. So we're going to talk about Relenza and Tamiflu. So both of them, if we take a look at them, they both look very similar to sialic acid. So here is the structure of sialic acid. On the right, we have Tamiflu, and on the left, we have Relenza. So if you notice, you can probably see that Relenza is more similar to sialic acid. And so that's going to become really important here. And what these NA inhibitors do is their entire goal is to mimic sialic acid. So they work on the last step of the virus's life cycle. So we're going to go ahead and pull up a fresh page here. And let's go ahead and draw a zoomed in image here. So here is the host membrane. Here is our sialic acid. And then on the viral membrane, of HERS, we have our neuraminidase, and that neuraminidase is going to cleave the top of that sialic acid to, of course, release the virions. So in terms of how the drug works, so why don't we go ahead and we'll make the drug a light pink. So when we have neuraminidase inhibitors, they're going to work by binding to the neuraminidase. So when the drug binds, it gets stuck. And because that drug now gets stuck, that's going to stop this maturation process from occurring. So if we were to zoom in 
Another way of drawing this, you all know I like to draw my enzymes as Pac-Man, is to have that drug stuck to that active site of the enzyme. Well, it turns out that if we go back to this idea of Tamiflu and Relenza, it turns out that Tamiflu actually, we get a lot of resistance to it very easily. And it all goes back to that structure. And the reason for this is the structure is not close enough to sialic acid. So it turns out that for Relenza, it's a lot harder to get resistance to it because it's more closely um, and more structurally closely similar to sialic acid. So scientists have actually, with Tamiflu and resistance to Tamiflu, they've actually looked at what happens and what are some of the amino acid substitutions that we get. So if we think about the active site of neuraminidase, and this is especially for Russell because I know he really enjoys the biochemistry of some of these things. So there are three amino acid substitutions that we see a lot of. We see an arginine at position 292 um, that is changed to lysine, and then we see an asparagine at 294 to serine, and then we see um, a histidine 274 to a tyrosine. So these are the more common amino acid substitutions that we see in the active site of the neuraminidase. Okay, so the next example that we're going to talk about is hepatitis C virus. And hepatitis C virus is definitely a success story. So for hepatitis C virus, if you recall from the beginning of the semester, it has a positive RNA genome and it is a flavivirus, so it's in the family Flaviviridae. And the reason that hepatitis C virus is a success story is that if we have patients that have hepatitis C, if they take the antivirals for long enough, they are actually able to be cured. And the reason that we can do this is because hepatitis C virus does not integrate its genome and its genome doesn't hang around. And so for this virus, when that genome enters, because it is positive RNA or sense RNA, it is going to get translated. And when it gets translated, it gets translated into one long peptide. And this is pretty common for a lot of viruses. And so HERS, if we have one long peptide, the virus is going to have to have some sort of a protease. It's going to go ahead and chop that peptide up to then get smaller peptides. And then, of course, those can go on to then fold, and each of those will have a function in the cell. One of them is probably the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, so on and so forth. So one of the drugs that we have for hepatitis C virus is the drug shown on the right. So this is teleprevir, and the way that teleprevir works is it actually tricks the protease. So if we look at the structure here, it kind of looks like a peptide. So we call this drug a peptide lookalike. So it certainly looks like a pretty small peptide, certainly not a large one, but if you take a look at it, you'll notice that the main functional groups that we see in amino acids, back when we ask you to draw and link together amino acids in Bio-185, it looks very similar to that. And so what teleprevir does is it's going to trick the protease, and the way that it does that is it binds to the protease, and protease gets stuck. So now, if you have a proteus that has this teleprevir stuck, now it can no longer continue working. 
So this is just one example of a hepatitis C virus antiviral. We have many drugs that are targeted against hepatitis C virus. So this table lists a bunch of them. And again, I do not expect you to know them, but um, this is just a really cool way of thinking about some of the other ones that we have. So there are many targets. We have targets against the polymerase. We have nucleoside analog. Um, when we think about non-nucleoside analogs, what that means is if this is our polymerase, then those non-nucleoside analogs are going to bind somewhere else. And so all that means is that it doesn't bind in the active site. So we also have a bunch of drugs against the protease. So again, we just talked about one. So teleprevir is against the protease, but we have a couple other ones. And then we have some combination drugs as well that are in different trial phases currently. So again, Hepatitis C virus is definitely very much so a success story. So when we think about antiviral drugs, you know, one of the things that oftentimes pops into our mind is this idea of broad spectrum. So for antibiotics, we have broad spectrum antibiotics that can be used against many different bacteria. And so the question becomes, well, is something like that possible for antivirals? So is a broad spectrum antiviral possible. And the best that I have for you is a solid maybe. Um, so let's talk about a couple of examples. And the first example that we're going to talk about is something that is known as LJ001. And um, the paper for this is actually linked on this page, and I'll also try to remember to put it into the description box as well. And so the way that this drug works is this drug works against enveloped viruses. And so the envelope is its target. It is currently not approved, and so this is taken from the paper that is linked, so it is from that study, and what this group has done is they have looked at different viruses that are, lift, that are listed here, and their families are also listed, and their types of genome, and then whether or not they have an envelope. So as you can see, based on this data here, this virus, this drug appears to work against viruses that have envelopes. So let's take a look at some of the work that they did there. So here is the structure of the drug. And um, this is more of a proof of concept, if you will, but it is a really nicely done paper. So if we take a look at these images. So we're going to start with this DMSO. So um, part of this study was done with VSV. So um, you can see the beautiful bullet shape of the virus and of her rabies is um, part of the Rhabdoviridae family, as is VSV. So for DMSO, this is our negative control. So this is going to be the absence of the drug and we can see that we get pretty little bullet shaped virions, which is very typical. Here is a, another drug and LJ025 actually has no antiviral activity. So you can see here that we get bullet-shaped virions. And then last but not least, all the way on the right, we have LJ001. And we can certainly see that those envelopes are disrupted. And so what these authors hypothesized is that the drug actually is going to attack the curves of viral membranes. So again, is a broad spectrum antiviral possible? May maybe, we don't know. Um, of course, this is, like I said, kind of a 
proof of concept type of thing. So let's talk about another really cool example. And that is Favipiravir and for Favipiravir. So we say that this is sort of broad spectrum for RNA viruses. And its target is going to be the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And it has action against a bunch of both positive RNA and negative RNA viruses. So again, there's a paper linked on this page as well, but we have seen this drug work against West Nile, against yellow fever, against Zika, against chikungunya virus. For some of the negative viruses, we've seen it work against Ebola, rabies, and measles. And again, when I say we've seen it work, that does not mean that we have seen it work in people. It just means that it has antiviral properties. And so for this drug, it's actually not approved in America. The safety and efficacy data has not yet been demonstrated, at least not enough to the FDA's liking. Um, in terms of other countries, Japan and China actually have approved this drug and they actually use it. And it's used against flu as well. So we can add flu onto here. And in terms of its mechanism of action, the hypothesis is that there's kind of two main ways that it works. So the first way that we think that the drug works, so let's go ahead and draw our RNA dependent RNA polymerase here. And then here is our drug. So our drug is going to get into the cell. We think one of the ways that the drug works is that it works by chain termination. And the other way, so let's go, we'll be good. We'll draw an RNA here. So the other way that this works is if we are replicating, we're going to add we're going to add a mutation here. So this is a lethal mutation or a non-viable mutation. And so even though virions may be produced from this, when they are produced, they have that mutation and um, it produces non-viable viral phenotypes. So these are the mechanisms of favipavir. So now that we've talked about a couple of examples, the next big group that we're going to talk about is HIV. So if you recall from day one from that chart that I showed you, most of our antivirals are against HIV. So I really enjoy this picture because it does a really nice job of showing us that there are a crap ton of targets. So we have drugs that target attachment and entry. We have drugs that target fusion, reverse transcription. We have integrase inhibitors and we have protease inhibitors. So there are a lot of targets. Another way for looking at this information is looking at it via a table. So here in this table, we see the target, and then we see the generic name and the brand name, and then the year that it came out in. So again, we have drugs against reverse transcriptase, against nucleotide and nucleoside, or nucleotide and nucleoside inhibitors, and then we have those non-nucleoside inhibitors. We have a lot of drugs against proteases and drugs against the integrases. And then we also have a couple of combination drugs. So in terms of HIV, our big problem is that we have relentless viral replication for years. And so of course we have this problem that the virus integrates. And because the virus integrates, you are of course infected for life. So relentless replication. So we're not going to talk about 
every single drug, just because there are a lot of HIV drugs, we're going to talk about one main HIV drug and then kind of talking about how the field has progressed. So let's talk about AZT. AZT is actually the first HIV drug that came on the market, and it is a pro drug. And the way that AZT works is it works as a chain terminator. So as you can see, we've got a base here, and here where we should have a um, free 3 prime OH, we do not. So from there, we can hypothesize that it's going to work as a chain terminator. And the way that it works is it actually binds to the active site of the reverse transcriptase. So we know that if we have a pro drug, the first thing that we have to do is we have to activate it. So to activate it, we can think back to how this happened with acyclovir. So in acyclovir, we had a viral enzyme that added a phosphate group and then a cellular enzyme that added on the other phosphate groups. Well, when it comes to AZT, this drug is actually phosphorylated by a cellular kinase. So unlike acyclovir, which requires that viral kinase to phosphorylate it, which is where the specificity comes from. For AZT, it's phosphorylated by a cellular kinase, and the specificity comes from the idea that it binds to reverse transcriptase. Now, you can imagine if we have a cellular kinase that is phosphorylating and not a viral kinase, one of the things that happens is we actually have more side effects. So AZT compared to acyclovir definitely has many more side effects. The other kind of problem with this drug is its half-life. It has a really short half-life. It's about one hour. And so what that means is that patients had to take this drug two to three times a day. And as you can imagine, resistant mutants are definitely selected for. And so for mutations that occur in this, we can actually get single amino acid substitutions, and those are going to occur in a purse reverse transcriptase. So when this drug first came out, it was actually split between patients. So one of the things that HIV patients would do is they would go fill their script if they if their script was able to be filled, because again, there were shortages, and then they would actually share their prescriptions. And so one of the things that we learned was that the doses that they were getting were much higher than they needed to be, but of hers, you know, these patients were only on one drug, and so this led to mutations. Eventually, a mutation occurred in a reverse transcriptase that gave the virus an advantage, and so then those viruses became the dominant population. But anyways, um, at the time, it was the best that we had. So this idea of AZT and these resistant mutants that were selected for and so quickly that it happened, what it actually led to was it led to combination therapy. And so what physicians saw was that if they used two drugs, then it took about less than one year to get resistance. And it was much quicker for when one drug was used. Um, and so one of the things that they did was they tried to have multiple targets. So perhaps if you had your reverse transcriptase and your integrase, maybe one of your drugs targeted the active site of the reverse transcriptase, another one targeted the integrase, or maybe you had two that targeted reverse transcriptase, but in different locations. So again, the idea was to have combination therapy to use more than one drug and more than one drug target. 
And so sometime later of hers, we eventually started adding drugs and we started to get to this idea of HIV cocktails. And now we have three drug combination therapy. And for this three drug combination therapy, um, it used to be that every single HIV patient had to be on three drugs. And if you were the filling pharmacist and, for example, you didn't catch that they were only on two drugs, your line was on the butt. So for the most part, majority of patients still are on three drugs. There is an exception to this that was recently approved by the FDA and it is a drug known as Jaluca. And Jaluca is a combination drug. So it has Dolutegravir, which is an integrase inhibitor, and it has Rilprevravin, which is a non-nucleoside inhibitor. And so they have two different drug actions, and it is the only one currently that is approved by the FDA where the patient can be on a two-drug combination therapy instead of a three-drug combination therapy. There are a lot of caveats with that. And there's a lot of things that patients have to go through before they can be approved to take that drug. But for the most part, it is a three-drug combination therapy. And so, again, here is just that summary once more of the different ways that we can target the HIV life cycle using antivirals. And typically, the goal is to have different targets. So when we think about HIV and antivirals, um, we've come a long way. So HIV, of course, we didn't learn a lot about it until the 1980s um, because that's when it first became a problem. But we had been studying retroviruses for much longer before then. So we had been studying Rouse sarcoma. And so we, of course, knew a lot about retroviruses, which is part of the reason why we have so many so many antivirals against HIV. And one of the things of hers that we have is something called ART, and ART just stands for antiretroviral therapy. And this antiretroviral therapy is usually that three drug combination that we have. And so now, of course, we are, we are able to produce more of these antivirals and getting antivirals to HIV patients is not as much of an issue as it was when we first came out with AZT. And so this antiretroviral therapy saves lives. So if we take a look at the two figures here on the top. So on the x-axis here, we have time. On the y-axis, we have the actual and projected numbers of people that are receiving antiretroviral therapy. So as you can see, that number has increased, which is great in the sense that we are able to get these antiretroviral therapies to more people. And on the bottom, we see how many people's deaths have been averted. So on the x-axis, we have time. And we're going to focus on the top half of the figure first. So this is the number of people dying of AIDS-related causes. So as you can see here, so this purple line, this is AIDS-related deaths without ART. This is with ART. So as you can see, 4.2 million adult deaths are averted. On the bottom of this figure here, this is ch um, children acquiring HIV infection. So 800,000 child infections are averted because of ART. So this is a really big deal. And a couple of final thoughts on HIV that are pretty sombering thoughts. And that goes back to this idea of mutations. So if we assume that one mutation is needed for drug resistance. And if the mutation rate is one every 10 to the four bases polymerized, that means that each base is substituted in every 10 to the four viruses. 
Each person on average makes about 10 to the 10 new viruses a day. We take that 10 to the 10 divided by 10 to the 4. That means that 10 to the 6 viruses will be produced each day with resistance to one drug. Now, of course, we can think about resistance developing to two drugs. So we've got 10 to the 4 times 10 to the 4, which is 10 to the 8th. Um, and then we can take that 10 to the 10 divided by 10 to the 8th, which means 100 viruses resistant to two drugs per day. If we go through that same thing with resistance to three drugs, then you need 10 to the 12th viruses to get resistance to those. So even though these are very sombering numbers, remember that replication is actually suppressed by these drugs. So that's why it's really important for patients to take their drug regimen. And right now, um, there are 10 to the 16th HIV genomes on this planet that exist. So it's kind of insane to think about this because with the number of HIV genomes that exist, it's probable that HIV genomes exist that are resistant to not only every single antiviral drug that we have, but any antiviral drug that we will ever have. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about something that is typically not in my antiviral lecture because we are not always in the midst of a pandemic. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to discuss the current coronavirus. And there are a lot of drugs that are currently under investigation. So on the bottom of this page, I've actually linked the clinical trials that are currently either ongoing or will be beginning soon. And some of them are for vaccines. Some of them are for different drugs. So I encourage you to check that out. I will also on Moodle, I will post. Um, it's about a 50-page document. I don't expect you to go through the whole thing, but um, the document has a bunch of current therapies that physicians are trying for these coronavirus patients. And we do not have time to talk about every single drug, but we're going to talk about some of the main ones. And the first one that we're going to talk about is Faviparavir. So we just recently saw this one. And for this drug, and I wish that there was another name because as you can tell, I really struggle with saying the name of this drug. But for this drug, this is the drug that, let me back up here for a second so y'all know what I'm talking about. This is the drug that is potentially could be a broad spectrum for RNA viruses. And so its target is the RNA dependent RNA polymerase and it works by chain termination and potentially causing and making the RNA dependent RNA polymerase um, put in the wrong base, which causes a mutation that can be lethal. So for this drug currently, um, we have a couple of clinical trials going on or ones that will be starting. So in Japan, um, in June, they're actually going to start a phase three clinical trial with this drug. And again, recall that in Japan and China, they normally use this drug for influenza. Um, in Italy and China, they actually launched clinical trials in March. And then in the U.S., we just got the okay a few days ago. And so in the U.S., we are going to start with phase two clinical trials. So phase one already happened, but we got the okay for phase two clinical trials. And this is going to be with about 50 people. And it's going to happen um, in a couple of hospitals in Massachusetts. So one of them was Massachusetts General Hospital. Another hospital was the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And there were a couple of other ones that I don't remember off the top of my head. So in the U.S., we just got the okay 
for phase two. So since we already talked about this one, we already know how this one works. So the second one that we are going to talk about is lopinavir and rotonavir. And lopinavir and rotonavir are actually a two drug combination and it's also known as Caletra. I swear, sometimes the brand names are not that much easier to pronounce than the generic names. But the structures of those two drugs are shown here on the right. And then on the left, this is the main protease. And this is the main protease of SARS coronavirus 2. And you can probably guess the way that these work because there's a giant protease on this page is they are protease inhibitors. So Caletra is actually used normally for HIV. And when this pandemic got bad, one of the things that scientists started doing was kind of taking all the antivirals that we have and throwing them at coronavirus and trying to see what happens. So for many of these um, in cell lines and in some animal models, we have seen efficacy. So for Caletra, um, this works as a protease inhibitor. So for coronaviruses, they have a positive RNA or a sense RNA genome. And when that genome gets translated, it gets translated into a longer peptide. And then we have a protease that chops that up into smaller peptides. And so this drug or these two drugs, I should say, works by blocking that protease. So it is a protease inhibitor. All right, so the next drugs that we're going to talk about, and we're going to group them together, and that is chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So here are the two structures that are shown on the right, and as many of you have probably heard and seen in the news, these actually treat or are used to prevent malaria, and this is a drug that is commonly spoken about our president, that he is encouraging people to use this drug. So let's talk about its antiviral effects. So recall that when viruses enter that are enveloped, so we'll just draw flu, they oftentimes can either fuse at the plasma membrane or they are endocytosed. And one of the things that has to happen is those protons have to be pumped in so that we decrease the pH. That decrease of the pH is, allow is what allows the fusion peptide to swing out and to fuse. And then we get the fusion of the lipid bilayer of the endosome and of the virus. So in terms of the antiviral effects of these two drugs, the way that they work is they actually increase endosomal pH. And so if we are increasing the endosomal pH, this is going to stop membrane fusion because we need that low pH. And so again, even though we have, it's been a long time since we've talked about coronavirus and the molecular mechanisms of it entering, you can hypothesize that if these drugs are being used and it's questionable still whether or not they work, but the mechanism of action and the way that we would suspect that it would work is because coronavirus gets endocytosed and ends up in an endosome. And so if we can stop that pH from decreasing, then maybe we can stop membrane fusion, which of course means that the genome doesn't get out. So that is why these drugs are being evaluated and um, that is why people are using them. Now, you have probably heard a lot about, well, you should be taking hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin. And so if you're wondering what the heck is this whole azithromycin business, um, azithromycin is not an antiviral. It is an antibacterial, so it is an antibiotic. 
But azithromycin has been shown to have anti-inflammatory activity, and so that is part of the reason that people have been using it. In addition, when you are infected with a virus, we of course know that makes you immunocompromised. It makes it easier to have a secondary infection. So we're actually seeing bacterial secondary infections um, in the lungs with many patients, so that's also a reason that it is being used. Now, last but not least, the last drug that we're going to talk about is remdesivir. So the structure of remdesivir is shown here on the right, and remdesivir is an adenosine analog. So it is a nucleotide analog, and it was actually originally designed against Ebola, and it is a prodrug. And the way that it works is it is actually going to interfere with the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and it's going to result in chain termination. And so, again, this is one that a couple years back was designed against Ebola, and um, it has, again, at best, we've seen maybe a little bit of activity against it. So this is another one where research is still ongoing, and we will kind of see what the world holds for us as this pandemic continues. So again, I encourage you to check out that link of the clinical trials, and I will post the different therapeutics um, that are outside of, it includes the ones we talked about, but there are a bunch of other ones outside of the ones that we talked about that are currently being used for COVID-19 patients. So thank you for hanging out with me and I will catch you in our next video. Bye everyone.